Hi there. So this is the first video in a series on representation theory of finite groups. And there's a lot to cover in this subject. Representation theory is a really fascinating and deep and broad area of math. But we're going to be using representation theory in the following videos to learn a lot more about finite groups than you might expect just from trying to do finite group theory directly. And in your first abstract algebra class where you learn about groups, you know, you'll learn a group is a set with a binary operation satisfying some axioms. And then you'll use those axioms to deduce all sorts of interesting things. You'll prove that there's only one group of order two up to isomorphism. And you prove that directly by using the group axioms. And representation theory is kind of a more indirect approach to studying groups. Instead of studying groups directly as sets with binary operations and thinking about what the axioms tell you about the set and the binary operation, we're going to think about how groups can act on vector spaces. And then we're going to use linear algebra to understand what's going on with those actions on the vector spaces. And because linear algebra is so powerful, it'll tell us a lot about the group that's acting. So that's the general plan for representation theory as a subject. But in this video, I just want to give a brief overview of some ideas. Why do we care about doing this? Why should we expect that this might be helpful at all? Uh, and what are some things we might see by the end of the course? So let's get started. Uh, and, and part one is just, why should we expect that representation theory is going to be useful for us? Um, and so I said that representation theory is about thinking about the way that groups can act on vector spaces. And why should we expect that that's going to help us understand groups? And so here's a first example. So in a group theory course, you might see one of the first non-abelian groups you encounter defined in this way. So here I've written a definition of this group DN, usually called the dihedral group. Uh, it has order 2N, it turns out. But from this definition, it's not obvious that the order is going to be 2n. Um, well, maybe it is if you've done enough group theory. But maybe the first time you see this group dn with this presentation, OK, we know it has a generator r, it has a generator f. And let's see, r has order n, f has order 2. So at least if n is odd, then this, has, this group has to have order at least 2n by Lagrange's theorem. Uh, we also see there's another relation that says rf has order 2. But just from those relations alone, it's not totally obvious how to tell how many elements there are in this group. How do we know how many words we could write in R and F without uh, getting redundancies? It's another way to say it. So how do we try to study the order of this group? One way is to um, think about it really directly, group theoretically, say, OK, uh, I have this, this element R, this element F. Everything in this group DN is going to be able to be expressed as R times F times R times R times F times R. These elements R and F both have final, uh, both have finite order. So certainly some string of R's and F's would be able to give us any element of the group we like. Um, but then we have to think about, okay, how many such strings could I write down that are actually unique, distinct elements of DN? And it turns out there's two N of them, which you can kind of see, you take this relation R times F squared equals the identity. And that shows you that it's possible to commute the R's and the F's past each other in some way. And so you can reduce everything down to sort of a standard form and discover that this group DN is actually some semi-direct product. And then you get a handle on the description of the group. But here's another way to see it, which you might also have learned in a first, uh, first course on group theory, which is that this group DN is also the symmetries of a regular n-gon. So um, let's say for D5, I'll do my best to draw a regular pentagon. OK, here's my best depiction of a regular pentagon. Uh, I'll call this P5 regular 5-gon. OK. And the point is that the dihedral group dn is really the symmetries of this shape. And what I mean by that is I'm going to imagine this regular pentagon sitting inside the plane, sitting inside R2, with the center of the pentagon right at the origin, and each of these points being one unit away from the origin. So in other words, you could think about this pentagon living in the complex plane, and the five vertices of the pentagon would be all the fifth roots of unity. That would be another way to see this. 
but you could certainly produce a regular pentagon like this. All the points are one unit away from the origin and they're equally spaced around the circle of radius one. And so we have this nice pentagon embedded in R2. And then by a symmetry of Dn, or sorry, a symmetry of P5, by such a thing, what I'm really going to mean is uh, linear transformation from R2 to R2, maybe let's call it T, such that when I apply this linear transformation to the pentagon, I get the pentagon back. And so every point in the pentagon will have to be in the image of this transformation. And we can see that the points in the pentagon span R2. For example, just this vertex and this vertex would be a basis for R2. So this condition that I am able to produce every point in the pentagon tells me that this linear transformation will be surjective. And because I'm going from R2 to R2, that'll tell me that the linear transformation is invertible. So I know that each of these symmetries is going to be a linear isomorphism from R2 to R2. It'll be represented by a two by two invertible matrix with real coefficients. And then we could try to think about how many transformations are there like this. And from linear algebra, we see, okay, a linear transformation is uniquely determined by what it does to a basis. So because these two points, let's call this A and B, because A and B are a basis for R2, to determine the entire linear transformation T to know the entire symmetry, all I have to do is figure out where should A go and where should B go. And okay, so it also turns out you can deduce from this condition that T of P5 equals P5, that all of the vertices have to end up at vertices. The, these points, these five vertex points are the furthest away from the origin. And so if we're gonna produce all of those five vertex points in the image of P5, we're gonna need to send vertices to vertices. And the linear transformation is invertible. So it's gonna have to induce a bijection on the set of vertices. So this vertex A is gonna have to go to another vertex and this vertex B is gonna have to go to some other vertex. And so for this reason, we see that there's at most maybe uh, five times four equals 20 different possible linear transformations like this. A has to go to one of the five vertices and B has to go to one of the four remaining vertices and five times four is 20. Okay, but it's not actually 20. It turns out there's only 10 elements in this dihedral group D5. So why is that? That's because this linear transformation, it'll have to send vertices to vertices. And so it'll send this basis of vectors of length one to another basis of vectors of length one. And it, as a result, it'll preserve the lengths of all vectors. This linear transformation T in order to be a symmetry of P5 will have to preserve the lengths of every vector. And so in particular, it'll have to preserve the length of the vector B minus A, or I guess this one that I drew is A minus B. So that vector has some length. You could go and compute it if you want, but that length has to be preserved. So I know that A and B have to get sent to vertices. And I know that A minus B has to get sent to a vector of the same length that it started with. And so that means that wherever A goes, B has to be adjacent. If we had some situation where like A went over here and B went over here, maybe B stayed in the same place, we'd have a problem because now A minus B would have grown too large. So we really see that this linear transformation T in order to be a symmetry of P5 has to be an invertible linear transformation that preserves lengths and sends these two vertices A and B to two adjacent vertices. So how many ways could I pick two adjacent vertices in the regular five gun? Well, okay, I can send A anywhere I want. That gives me five choices. But then wherever I send A, let's say I decide I wanna send A over here, then B has to be adjacent. So B could be over there or B could be over there. There's two options. So there's five times two equals 10 possible linear transformations like this. So now the order of D5 we can see is at most 10. But actually the order is exactly 10. By sending A to a vertex and B to an adjacent vertex, that tells me where to send my basis. So that gives me a unique linear transformation from R2 to R2. And we see that it'll be invertible because the image will still be a basis. The image of A and B, I mean, will still be a basis. And that linear transformation will send P5 to P5. Um, you can sort of see by trying to construct the other vertices as sums and differences of A and B. So by sending A to one of these vertices and B to an adjacent vertex, I'll get a linear transformation that sends P5 to P5. I'll get a symmetry of P5. So each of these uh, 
each of these symmetries is an element of D5, and there's exactly 10 of those symmetries. So now we see that the order of D5 is 10. So let me write that here. Okay, so the order of Dn is 2n, because this is the number of ways to map a pair of adjacent vertices to a pair of adjacent vertices. So just by thinking about the elements of Dn as linear transformations and using linear algebra, understanding the lengths of vectors in R2 and that linear transformations from R2 to R2 are injective if and only if they're surjective, these sorts of linear algebraic facts allow us to more easily understand this group Dn. And then the question becomes, okay, well, the original definition of Dn was in terms of this presentation, but then I drew some picture about symmetries of a polygon and why are those going to give me abstractly the same group? Why is this presentation of the group Dn the same as this other description, the second definition, Dn being defined as the automorphism group of this regular n-gon? Why are those the same thing? So that's a separate question, um, but it actually turns out not to be too hard to show once you have these facts established. I don't want to take the time to do that right now. This is just supposed to be an overview of uh, why might we think linear algebra could help. But this is a nice example where linear algebra helps us understand the behavior of a group by thinking about how it arises as acting on objects in vector spaces. So this group Dn we defined abstractly, but then we realized it more concretely as the automorphism group of some kind of object in a vector space. And that helped us a lot. So that's a basic example of how representation theory can help us understand groups. But representation theory, like I said, turns out to be way more powerful than just this sort of basic argument. You can do all sorts of amazing things in representation theory, things that really might not seem obvious ahead of time. And so I'll, I'd like to talk about a couple of those next. So, um, right, so part two is called uh, linear algebra is magic. Uh, and I'm just gonna list some results that are true and that we'll be able to show using representation theory um, by using the magic of linear algebra, the strength of that theory to deduce things about representations of finite groups and then use those observations to learn things about the finite groups themselves. So here's a true fact. Uh, let's take an arbitrary non-abelian group and let's consider the proportion of elements in that group which square to the identity. So which, you know, this, this quantity here is measuring what's the percentage of elements in G which have order one or two. And something you might prove in a first group theory course. So here's a fact. Um, if every element of your group has order one or two, then your group is abelian. So if I have a group where this percentage turns out to be 100%, then the group has to be abelian. But then the next question is, okay, how close could we get to 100% if the group is not abelian? You know, if the group's not abelian, it definitely has to be less than 100%, because if it was 100%, the group would be abelian. But could we get arbitrarily close? Could we find a non-abelian group where 99% of the elements are of order one or two? And the amazing answer is no. There's really an upper bound on how close you can get to 100%. In fact, the closest you could possibly get is the square root of 5 eighths. If more than root 5 eighths of the elements in G have order one or two, then G has to be abelian. And the best proof I know of this fact goes through representation theory. Um, there's a follow-up question of whether this bound can be attained. I mean, this number root 5 eighths is irrational, so there's no way we could find a particular finite group where exactly square root of 5 eighths of the elements have order one or two. But we might wonder if we could get arbitrarily close, and that's a much harder question. But it is easy to prove this upper bound that at most root five-eighths of the elements can end up having order one or two. So that's something we'll be able to show at some point. Here's another fun fact. So let's take a, a finite group of odd order, any finite group of odd order, and we can count the number of conjugacy classes in that finite group. Let's say that number is little k. That's how many conjugacy classes we have. Then it turns out to be true 
that the number of conjugacy classes is congruent to the order of the group mod 16. That's just a true fact, which is really quite remarkable. It tells you, for example, if I had a finite non-abelian group, well, every finite non-abelian group has to have some conjugacy class of order greater than one. If you have a conjugacy class of size one, it means that the element in that conjugacy class commutes with everything, no matter how you conjugate, you get back to itself. So that element would be in the center. So if every conjugacy class has size one, then your group has to be abelian. So if I have a finite non-abelian group of odd order, then at least one of these conjugacy classes has size at least two. So there's fewer conjugacy classes than there are elements in the group. And then the number of conjugacy classes you might think, okay, maybe there's just one conjugacy class of order two and everything else has order one. And that's not possible. If you have a non-abelian finite group of odd order, there has to be at least 16 fewer conjugacy classes than there are elements, just because all the conjugacy classes can't have size one. So the number of conjugacy classes will be less than the order of G. And then they'll have to differ by at least 16 because they're congruent mod 16. So that's an interesting observation. And we'll be able to prove that also with the representation theory of finite groups. And let's do another one. So let's take, oh, I have a typo here. Let's take a normal subgroup of G of index two. So then when I have a normal subgroup, it means it's closed under conjugation. So the normal subgroup itself is gonna be a union of conjugacy classes. There will be conjugacy classes that are inside the normal subgroup, and there are conjugacy classes that are outside the normal subgroup. And the amazing fact is that no matter which normal subgroup you pick of any finite group, if it has order two, the number of conjugacy classes inside the normal subgroup, this is another typo, will be at least as large as the number of conjugacy classes outside the normal subgroup. There will be at least as many conjugacy classes inside N as there are outside N. And so, for example, if you think about the symmetric group, the conjugacy classes in the symmetric group are in bijection with cycle types. And a nice normal subgroup of Sn of, of index two would be the alternating group An. So those are the even permutations. And so the conclusion here is that there are at least as many even cycle types as there are odd cycle types. And this fact, I believe, was first proved by Euler, um, not using representation theory, of course. He uh, had some very interesting argument using generating functions. But this will turn out to be a, a really easy thing to prove with some very basic representation theory. And it applies not just to SN, where Euler had to write this fancy proof with generating functions, but to absolutely any normal subgroup in any finite group, any normal subgroup of index two. OK. So those are just a couple quick facts about representation theory, hopefully kind of an interesting teaser for what we'll talk about soon. Um, we won't get to these proofs quite yet. First, we have to build up some theory, talk about you know what is a representation? How do we try to work with representations? How do we try to identify representations up to isomorphism? So there'll be a lot of theory to develop, but once we have some basic tools under our belt, we'll be able to tackle problems like these and learn these sorts of facts about finite groups that turn out to be quite hard to show with just direct group theory arguments, but are quite easy to show via representations. All right, I hope that was interesting and I'll see you next time.